I want to thank you all for being here today. It's, I know it's a hot, it's not even a, it's not even summer yet, but uh, we have work ahead of us, and we're very thankful for your commitment. Uh, I do want to start off by just saying that you know today we have uh, two presentations. Uh, with us today. Some of the things we're going to agree on, some of the things we may not agree on, but we're here to listen, learn, and learn how to work together going forward, together as, uh, as we all do here in the city of Fort Worth. So uh, thank you all for being here. The rabbi cannot be here today, so I'm going to read you a little statement that he sent to us, and it just says, friends, good evening. Let me wish you blessings for tomorrow, well, for today's meeting. As I mentioned, I will be unable to attend due to Jewish holidays. I look forward to hearing about the discussion. Please relate to the opening co-chair's comments the following. And I'm reading his email. Good afternoon. I hope everyone is well. Unfortunately, I am unable to be with you today as I am in the midst of celebrating the Jewish holiday. Shabbat. 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 I would like to thank everyone for the honor that you are extending to our invited guests, each other and the entirety of Fort Worth. I hope that we will all keep the words, we are made wise, not by the recollection of our past, but by the responsibilities for our future. And that's a quote from George Bernard Shaw. In the forefront of our discussions for building a shared and responsible future is within our grasp. Let me wish God's blessings to us as we continue to build a responsible future for the entirety of Fort Worth. So I think this says a lot of what we will be doing today, but I also want to give our co-chairs, Lily and Bill Gray, a chance to make a few remarks. Oh, thank you. That was, um, that was very well done. Uh, I just want to thank everybody who joined us May 1 downtown when we uh, did the presentation to City Council. We, we uh, walked away feeling encouraged and uh, wanted to share that with you. Some of you were there, and I think if you wanted to add anything, you certainly could, but great meeting, um, and left some of them, left some of them asking, um, what's the next step, what do we do now? So we have full attention on, on the things that we elevated. Hopefully you spend some time looking at the final product, and, um, and that if there are any changes or ads and all, you will build on that, because that's exactly what they got. So, um, good encouraging news. Thanks, everybody, for being here today. Okay. Uh, I'd just like to say that <clears throat> some of you know that I was skeptical coming into this process because I wasn't sure uh, if the city meant what it asked us to do. After we presented to uh, the council the other day, I was really impressed <laughs> that they were impressed, that meaning the council. But I also heard feedback from people who didn't trust this process beforehand, that I was criticized for. People saying, we know you guys are not going to do anything. And they still may decide that at the end of this process. But in the middle of the process, what they decided was, what we had already done, what you had already done, what you had already done, made a statement. Those findings that you presented to the council said, we know there are issues in Fort Worth that need to be dealt with. That surprised a lot of people in Fort Worth, including critics, people who were criticizing me in the process. So that was a major hurdle, I think, that we got over, that we presented something that the city had to acknowledge as being credible, among other things. Now, as I like said, the, the, the big the problem is, what do we do next? The solutions. Again, that comes to you. I mean, you committee chairs, you people on the committee, hey, come, come back with some real solutions that we can present to the council. Will they follow them? I don't know. But the reaction we had from the mayor and the city council was very positive at that meeting that we had. So I was, I was impressed by that. Uh, and I'm, I, I think we will have a finished product that will help guide this city, and maybe many others. I, I was reminded just this week that the Human Relations Commission, which was founded 50 years ago, because I was with Dr. Gwen, who was the first black member of the Fort Worth City Council, who was presiding at the time that commission was formed. And he said, you know, the first 
They heard from about 50 cities around the country saying, how did you do this? How did you create a human relations commission? And Dallas was the first city to ask, send me what you have. My hope is, is that in addition to our own city embracing what we do, there will be cities from around the country who will say, tell us how you did what you did. So I, th I think we're at, at a good moment here, and I, I didn't mean to talk that long. But, so I just want to thank all of you for everything we've done. We're, we're nine months in. We've asked for you to give a few extra months. <laughs> Apologize for that, but I think it's for the good of what we're trying to do. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask if anybody that was there at the meeting, uh, the council meeting, pre-council, if y'all have any comments that y'all would like to share of what you all saw. Charles? I just want to say I think all four of the co-chairs did an outstanding job of presenting. You didn't pull any punches. Uh, you just laid it out there straight. And I was impressed that it was well received by the council. Uh, almost all of them had positive feedback and uh, I felt encouraged. Uh, just like Bob. Good. Anybody else? Uh, I also say we did ask the council because, as you know, that we have some leadership training going on, and we asked the council if there's uh, any of them that would like to have some of that training for their districts to please reach out to us. And uh, we have had a couple of council members reach out to us. Kelly uh, has been one of them, and then Brian Bird has been another to do some leadership training in their districts. So I wanted to give you all that information. Uh, the next on our agenda is the approval of minutes for the April 16th, if you've all had a chance to review. Oh, sorry. Several, several errors. Okay, Tim? Yes, there are several errors. Oh, any minutes? Okay. Can you, let's review them. Sure. On uh, page two of the minutes, <laughs> paragraph three, where it says Sheriff Waver. The first statistic that's given, 80% do not have a high school education. According to my notes and according to the video that I reviewed this afternoon, that number is 90%. The second statistic, 80% do not have a father in their life. According to my notes and the video I reviewed this afternoon, that number is 90%. Third statistic, 25% of the prison population is under the care of MHMR. After I looked at my notes and reviewed the video, that number is 40%. And I also believe there's some, you, yeah, you can review the video also. I mean, feel free to. <laughs> um, also, there's some other important information that we share but he, because he talks about prevention, which would be really good to be in here, in here because this is what we're wanting to see. Uh, because he also says that 70%. This is from my notes and from the video as well. 70% of those who are fatherless and have no diploma, 70% of those who are fatherless or who have no, no, no diploma will end up in the care of MHMR or in the county jail. 70%. And he also says, he, he said that he really strongly recommended that we work on preventative action which would be working with the state of Texas to, uh, to cut the red tape so that people can adopt. <laughs> I think it's very important to what, we, what we're doing here. Rosa? Yes? Um, I, I just need some feedback from the task force. Our staff was asked to go through training with the city secretary to make our minutes more succinct, to match what minutes are really supposed to be. And because of that, these were much, much shorter. If you want us to go back to how they were, I'm fine with that, but I just want you to know why they were quite a bit shorter this time, because the staff that is responsible for doing the minutes were told that our minutes were more of a, um, a transcript rather than minutes. Of so. course, and I totally understand. I deal with minutes all the time, but one of those things is, is shorter doesn't mean reducing the numbers. Sure, sure. And I think the 25%, you mentioned 40, there was 25% are diagnosed, 15% were like not diagnosed. 40% is under the care of MHMR. I, okay, I'll double and, check And it's, on, it's in my notes and I'll video. double check because I looked back and I wanted to say it said 15% were not under, but they thought that, that there was some connection or something. They're undiagnosed. 
but I'll double check. I'll double check. Okay. That's good. Anything else before we go any further? Because Tim? Oh, no, I'm fine. That's, okay. All right. Um, one of the things that we might want to do is take a look at where this falls in our committee structure. Uh, so it could be something that we provide uh, Todd with your committee so that you have this information so it goes on to your recommendations as well. Okay. And, and I don't know if this is the appropriate time to bring this up, but I know um, we're tasked with the city of Fort Worth and going into the county statistics, is that an avenue that we want to venture off in or keep it limited to the city of Fort Worth? We were tasked for the city of Fort Worth. Okay. I would just ask, doing. though, I would add to that, though, the one most impressive thing about the presentation is that it was data-driven. In addition to the, the, the format and, and, you know, facts count. So I would say city of Fort Worth, but to the, to the degree that we can get more data, I think that speaks because we're not in isolated. We operate under town and county. Absolutely. Yes. Does that make sense? It does. Okay. And, and I'll, I'll also add that, and particularly since now Fort Worth prisoners are going to be housed in the Tarrant County Jail, and I would add to your comments, Tim, that the sheriff didn't know a lot of things that I thought he should have known, uh, or at least didn't give us information on that, that we still need more information about Tarrant County. That, to me, that, that's important. I mean, Fort Worth is the county seat of Tarrant County. And again, it goes back to that may be something one of your, that your committee could, you know, get that information. Okay. Katie, you had your hand. I was going to say almost the same thing that Bob Rader said. Okay. Thank you. Um, we can work a lot. Um, so at this time, we can table these minutes until our next meeting so that Angie can have time to go back and, you know, make sure that, you know, all the numbers are correct and so forth and maybe add a few other data points on here. Sure. Okay. Can I take a motion to table these minutes to our next so for verification? Second. All in favor? Aye. All right. Aye. Next on our agenda is a discussion about equal access to public accommodations, including enforcement of dress code, uh, codes by bars in the West 7th Street. As I stated earlier, um, you know, we are going to hear some things that we're going to agree upon and maybe not agree upon, but we're also going to talk constructively. We've got some guests with us today that are going to talk about the Bar Association. These are leaders there in the West 7th. Uh, we have Tino DeFranco with Whiskey, uh, Whiskey Bar. Uh, Marcel LeBlanc with uh, Velvet Box and Brian Paul, right, uh, with Bar 2909. So um, we'll go ahead and open it up so that you can, you know, let us know a little bit about what you all are doing on this topic. Do you want to uh, re uh, read our opening statement there? Tino, do you have that with you? Uh, sure. Uh, my name is Tino DeFranco. Sorry. Uh, I'm the president of the West 7th Restaurant and Bar Association. Is that better? Um, I'm also one of the owners of the Whiskey Garden Bar that's in the area. Um, one of the things we, we would like to say, just to dispel any uh, rumors that are going around, is we do not racially profile or discriminate in any manner at all. Not in our customer base, not within our employee ranks, not within our owner ranks, not within our management ranks. Uh, it's just a false rumor. And that's what I'm here to address, you know, address the concerns. Now, we do have... Reasons that we do deny people. We deny people for, you know, reasons of safety, uh, reasons of appropriateness, and for dress code. And the dress code is not discriminatory in any manner. So uh, I'd like to say that uh, I'm glad that we're having this discussion because I think it's important that we do communicate because sometimes things are assumed that aren't correct. So that's why we're here. Hi, my name is Marcel LeBlanc. I own Velvet Box. Uh, we are the only retailer in uh, the core area uh, south of Crockett that's independent in the bar area. And um, when I read the article about varsity, I never bothered to ask James if it was true. I thought like a business owner. My first thought was how could the Fort Worth Weekly, who, gives ad who he gives advertising dollars to, ambush him with such a one-sided article? I've worked with all of these bar owners in the core area at some point in time, and first and foremost, we are all entrepreneurs. 
We have invested our life savings in the core area and want to see it do well. We take everyone's money as long as they are not intoxicated or destroying our property. Safety is our number one priority. My following statements are about community and my, my direct neighbors. I'll tell you a little bit about how I met James and Josh, the owners of Varsity. When they first moved in with their incredible popularity, um, I had people that were climbing up the backside of my building, destroying my property and moving the gas line to the point where I thought the building would blow up. So I went and I introduced myself to the gentleman at Varsity and they walked over and saw the damage that their patrons were doing to our building and they retrofitted the building according to my specifications, and they never sent me a bill. In addition, Bar 2909, who moved in directly to the east of me, was putting a lot of pressure on our parking. Um, we are one of the few people in the entire core area that own the building and have our own parking. And it was greatly inhibiting our business. So I went to the owners of Bar 2909 and explained to them what, what kind of things that were happening to us. And so we worked out a deal where they help us to pay for a parking lot attendant to uh, work on security on the weekends when the, the traffic is heaviest. So this is how our neighbors work together for the greater good for the community. And that's all I have to say. Hi, everybody. My name is Brian Paul, and uh, I'm the, one of the partners in Bar 2909. And, uh, and, and part of the West 7th Restaurant and Bar Association. I've been in the industry for a long time, and uh, since 1982, so it's, uh, I'm definitely one of the older people uh, in, the, uh, in the industry down here. And I've uh, been a part of a lot of different associations and, uh, and been a part of different clubs you know, all around the country, uh, anywhere from you know, North Carolina to Nevada to Colorado and, uh, and all over Texas, basically. Came to Fort Worth and started doing business here uh, back in, I guess it would have been 2000. And the one thing that that uh, I really love about Fort Worth and what really made me feel good about being here and being part of this community is, you know, in the restaurant and bar business, there's a lot of comp there's a lot of competition and people they compete hard with each other, and a lot of times, you know, relationships, uh, you know, with different bar owners are very are very coarse and. And, uh, and not very friendly. Uh, the thing that's, that's been wonderful about down here is uh, when we joined the West 7th Restaurant and Bar Association, we really didn't know what to expect. And what's great about here is all the club owners get along very, very well. They communicate very well. Uh, they, they share concerns in the area on what's best, you know, long term for not only the association, but also for the city of Fort Worth. We work hand in hand with a lot of different, uh, a lot of different facets of, uh, of, of law enforcement, whether it be TABC, whether it be the, you know, the, uh, the fire marshal's office or Fort Worth PD, uh, gang task force, uh, and everything in between, basically. And you know, we've been a part of different different meetings with the stakeholders and stuff that are the property owners in, in the area. Um, I guess to to wrap things up, just want to say that I'm just glad that we're part of an association that communicates. And if there's any issues that need to be dealt with, I know that this association is more than capable of dealing with it. That's all for me. Bob. Do you have a limit on the number of minorities you want in the establishment at any one time? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Let me say this, and again, I've never been to any one of your meetings. I just grew up in Fort Worth. I've covered these situations for many years. Would it surprise you to say that many of your dress codes are straight out of night? from 30 years ago when bars in North Dallas and downtown Fort Worth had the same ones and they were meant to discriminate against blacks and Hispanics. Would that surprise you? Yeah, it would surprise me. Um, it, uh, I, you know, s since we had the meeting with, uh, you know, with the Fort Worth uh, task force on, on uh, the gang task force and stuff in, in Fort Worth, it, uh, I would say that the, that the dress codes that we have at this point in time uh, seem to follow some of the some of the warnings that they've been giving us. So um, it. Uh
I'll, I'll just ask one more question. I'll, I'll shut up so that young people can ask. I don't, have, you, have you seen a Facebook posting? And this is something that the uh, Human Relations Commission used to do, where they send in to these establishments people of one race who are admitted, and then they come in with the same attire, somebody who is black or Hispanic, and they're denied, which, I mean, there's a Facebook posting right now, and I, I don't know who they are, not agree with me, and, and I don't believe everything I see on Facebook by any means, but the fact that people who are white wearing the same thing that people who are black get admitted, and people who are black don't get admitted, do you think that happens? If that happens, it's an isolated incident. That's not indicative of our, our customers. But who decides that? Who, de who decides? I mean, it's a all, the biz all the business owners. As a matter of fact, before any of the incidents that they brought up about varsity came about, we already got together proactively, you know, encouragement from Fernando about coming up with a uniform dress code, because we, we agree. We, we, we want it to be fair. We want it to be universal. We want to be all on the same page. You know, that's one of the reasons we formed this association. But does it, is it, if we, we wouldn't discriminate against one race for wearing something for any reason. If we don't allow that, we just don't allow it. But, but if, go ahead. A couple things was, one, can we get a copy of this dress code that you've adopted? It was, it was, it was, it was dress code. Code. my apologies. Um, playing catch up from being out of town. Um, when was it, does it say when it was adopted? We are still finalizing it, but one of the, okay. how we, this is where we started. If some of you remember, Kung Fu got into some trouble in Dallas and the Justice Department got involved and the Justice Department changed their dress code and approved a dress code. Now we based our universal dress code on that Justice Department approved dress code. And that's where we started. And you know, here's an example. Here's an, ex here's an example. Sometimes there's, there's dress codes that are appropriate. Uh, for example, I have a pool in my bar. You can wear swim attire in my bar. You're encouraged to. But some of these other bars aren't going to allow you to wear swim attire. It's not appropriate. So you'll see that on my dress code, but you won't see that on theirs. Some, some things aren't appropriate for Fred's that might be appropriate for me, if that makes sense. Is there going to be a complaint process? So if someone's denied access sure. for any reason that there's, there's some that, way that they should that complaint, We answer that complaint we put. Tom? Oh, thank you. Um, one of the differences between the Justice Department approved dress code at Kung Fu and the dress code that you all have, there are apparently four differences, and I'm, I'm just wondering why. Um, no biker cuts or vest is on yours, Correct. not on Kung Fu's. Excessive visible tattoos, specific brand style shoes, i.e. Jordans, or Timberlands, excessive visible jewelry. Can you explain to me what safety, uh, how those uh, are conducive to product, banning those are conducive to a productive, safe, and fun environment? Yeah, I'll be happy to speak on that. There's, uh, in Texas, uh, there's a, as when it comes to different uh, biker facets and biker gangs, uh, you have the Mongols, the outlaws, the pagans, the sons of silence, uh, hell's angels, and some other, you know, uh, and banditos and so forth. So what cuts are is basically their tags or their colors and stuff like that. So it's it's it, it's gang related, and uh, and it, but we still enforce that, you know, uh, unilaterally. Uh, it was just I guess it was just a few weeks ago where we had, uh, you know, the. Uh, there's also a police chapter called the Iron Pigs, of all things, uh, that, uh, that they're, they're a, uh, a uh, motorcycle club, and, uh, and they, they, don't get, uh, they don't get access either because we just have to stay consistent with it. In regards to the, uh, what was the other question, ma'am? I'm sorry. Well, it was uh, specific Brand styles, shoes, 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 excessive visible tattoos. Yeah, t tattoos is something that uh, was brought to our attention to really watch out for by the uh, Fort Worth uh, gang unit primarily. And there's different things that you're going to look for. 
you're going to look for different things like cobwebs. Cobwebs signify a lengthy prison term. Uh, a teardrop means that they have committed murder. A uh, five-point crown is, is the Latin king, so if you see a crown with five points, uh, we look out for that. Uh, three dots means uh, my crazy life, which is also uh, something that happens in prison. Um, a clock with no hands means that they've had significant prison time. If you see uh, double lightning bolts, uh, that's the Aryan Brotherhood, and, uh, the stand, and, the, and the lightning bolts, they stand for, uh, for the SS. Um, then if you start seeing different area codes, like 817 or 713 or 512 or anything like that, that signifies where that facet of, 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 the, of, the, gang, of the gang is located. Um, it, uh, you know, it, facial tattoos, we watch out for those uh, especially, um, because then you're talking you know, MS-13 and you're talking Aryan Brotherhood at that point in time also. Um, do we get a lot of that down there? No, we don't. Very little, to be honest with you. Um, but, uh, but it's still stuff that we, that we, that we pay attention to and, uh, and do our best to keep the area safe. Uh, from being in this industry for a long time, you know, I, I you know, have seen different areas that have had a lot of challenges. And it wasn't too long ago when you uh, look at what happened down at Deep Ellum. I don't know if it was 10 years ago, 15 years ago, or whatever, but it was a, it was a thriving area, and it hit a, a and, and ended up getting a very large contingency of uh, the wrong crowd down there. And uh, it, it pretty much put, put Deep Ellum uh, in a very, very rough position for many, many years. It, uh, it was literally tear gas at night, and some of the club owners that I knew down there were literally putting uh, bottles of water and coolers outside their front door so the patrons could wash tear, tear gas off their faces. Um, it, uh, we're, we're very fortunate here in Fort Worth to have a, a, robu a, a robust nightclub scene and a very safe nightclub scene. And I would argue also, uh, I'm very, very confident as a matter of fact, I, and you know, we can't speak for all the bars or anything like that. You know, we, we, we do have a good uh, relationship with most of them. But more than anything, I think that the West 7th area is one of the most diverse places in Fort Worth. I mean, it's, uh, I don't know how many on this panel uh, or in this room you know, go, down, go out to the West 7th area at midnight on a Friday, Saturday night. Um, I see more diversity there than I see anywhere. Um, it's uh, we are we're in the business to we're in the business to make money, um, but we're also in the business to keep everybody safe. Uh, if, if somebody comes up to our doors and they're dressed properly and they're acting properly, uh, they get access. Uh, we, we, you know, we like to make some money. Okay. When, when, when the excessive visible. Um, Jewelry. Jewelry. It's that's something. If that started back back in L.A. years years and years ago, um, and when it started in L.A., it was probably back. And I will agree, this is quite a while ago. Like you were talking about, uh, it was probably back in the '70s or the '80s uh, when when the the gang issues were really really huge out there, and uh, and that's where a lot of the baggy clothing and stuff came into also because when people would come to when when the different gang members would get ar uh, arrested. Um, they, they would, to avoid having to do long uh, prison terms or anything like that, they would, they would literally take everything away from them to prevent them from hurting themselves, whether it be shoelaces and belts and so forth. And that's where it became a, a signification of real baggy things, and jewelry was a part of that. Um, it, uh, you know, the, and the, one of the things with the jewelry is, uh, you know, it, it was considered the more the merrier, and whether it be real or not, and the shinier the better, and that was part of the gang attire back then. Hi. Yes, my question goes back to the question I don't think you addressed about the specific brands of shoes, about Jordans and Timberlands. Why particularly those two brands? Yeah, it's, uh, once again, I'm no expert on any of this stuff, but I try and do the best I can to keep updated with it. Um, the the Aryan Brotherhood, MS-13, what they're going to try and wear is they're going to wear uh, Cortez, I think they're called Cortez shoes, where they're basically kind of a Nike uh, and, and with a uh, you know, uh, Nike swoop, but not high top. Um, some of the other gangs, they, they call it kick-ups, and, which, uh, and with the, those are primarily is, is very white and very new uh, high top tennis shoes, um, whether it be uh, Jordans or whether it be Adidas or Pumas or Converse, uh, but being new, you know, is the key. Um, uh, that's something that a person does look out for. Uh, and also, also Timberland, uh, Timberland work shoes also. So what that, 
you know, I had a, I've had a career in handling gang prosecution, and I, I've never seen an area, particularly where Cortez, in particular, Jordan Brand shoes. Uh, in banning Jordan Brand tennis shoes and Timberlands in particular, uh, what type of uh, individuals have been turned around primarily by these two brands being excluded? And then I will also ask, do you consider Sperry's as a particular brand or Cowboy Western Boots a particular brand to try to look at a particular gang affiliation when you're trying to return down a patron? I mean, go ahead, Tina, if you want. Uh, yeah, um, uh, it's not, again, it's not based on race. It's based on the full presentation of what they're wearing. And yes, we turn away everyone. I'll, ha I'll give you an example. I own Jordans. I don't go out in them because most places don't accept them. Here's another example. Five years ago, when I had a bar, we didn't allow uh, Adidas three-stripe white shoes. And that changed because it just kind of went away as popularity. Uh, we didn't allow uh, polo boots. And that changed because it just went away as popularity. Um, what we've noticed is that the, the dress code is dynamic over time. 30 years ago, like he said, I couldn't get into a bar with visible tattoos at all. As a man, I couldn't get into a bar with facial hair. I couldn't get into a bar if I had earrings. I couldn't get into a bar if my shirt was untucked. But that's all changed now. So it is dynamic, and we do address it. Um, are cowboy boots? No, I don't, I don't look at it as a risk. But for example, um, going back to the tattoos, I didn't know this, and I've been in this business for 27 years. When the gang unit came to us, do you realize the the Cowboys logo, the star, the Cowboys logo, is co-opted by some of these gangs. That's my favorite team. You know what I mean? But I have to look out for that. I have to see. I might not turn you down, but there's some, there's, there's, there's sometimes the full picture when a guy comes up and he looks a little nefarious, he has some of those other tattoos, and you see a cowboy star on his hand, you might go, oh man, I don't know. But it has nothing to do with his race, it has to do with the way he looks. Yolanda, Yolanda, oh, wait, let's go one at a time, Yolanda. Question four of the chairs, did we have an opportunity to reach out to the Cowboys Association and get an invitation to the owner of the Varsity Tavern? Because it sounds as if these are representatives and they were not there at the incident, so I don't want to hear secondhand about a situation what, did we? Did he not? Did they not respond? Did we, no, we did. We did invite Varsity Tavern to participate in this discussion. They respectfully declined because they are the subject of a formal complaint that's currently under investigation by the Human Relations Unit. Can you guys talk for a second uh, about how frequent this patrons are turned away? Is it a daily thing, a weekly thing? Can you quantify it a little bit, number one? And second question, how much time do you spend communicating to your staff about how to go about uh, enforcing the address code? It is, it, it, we have a pre-shift meeting uh, every shift on the weekends, and uh, those are our popular times, and that's discussed every single shift, every single shift. And how regularly are people doing? We turn away people quite often, but it's not based on dress code. There's a lot of reasons we got to turn away people. People that come in with try to use fake IDs, people that come in or but based on dress code, how frequently people this it's every weekend. It's every weekend. Yeah. What's that? What percentage would be black or brown? I have no idea. You don't keep tabs on that? No. Do you think you should? No. Why not? Because in that behavior then Aren't we, isn't that what we're fighting against? No, no it's not. Not if you're correcting it. Well, I well, think I mean, that's why they're here. That's, that's why, why we're here. With us. I'm turning away per a person based on my belief that there could be trouble. I'm trying to preempt that. Yes, uh, thank you. Hey, thank you guys for being here today. Uh, I, I hang around that area quite a bit. I had a corporate apartment in um, the lofts at West 7 for five years. Very familiar with the area. Very familiar with the shift between day and night. I'm a member of LA Fitness there. I'm there almost every day. I'm waving at Marcel. Or yeah, I don't go into your business. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> but um, I've, had the, I've had plenty of opportunity because I'm there a lot. 
I mean, that's just, I'm just there. I had plenty of opportunity to talk to just about any person I could find younger who would go into these businesses. And I asked various ones, just on my own, of all colors, have you been turned away? The answers came back, every single one of them said yes. They all said, yeah, I've been turned away at one point or another. I also asked the question, do you felt like any of this is racist? And some of them said yes. Most of them said, of course not. That's, that, those are the people that I just sampled. I just was talking to people at the gym, talking to people in the parking lot, talking to people on the street that I run into. A lot of people know me around there, so I'm not, you know, they know I'm not too scared. I'm old, too old to be over there. But, uh, but I, did, I did just go ahead and do my own surveys. And I just found every single person, though, that I talked to, every younger person who's tried to get into one of those businesses have been turned away at one point or another, which just means that it's being enforced. And it's being forced across all you know, colors. I can't say whether there's, uh, you know, I, certainly I don't know whether there's racism at play or not. But in the event of an employee, uh, I, I have employees. You guys have employees as well. Uh, in the event that you have an employee, someone that you've hired, you've screened, you've hired, and they make a bad judgment call like that. And, and it could be beyond a bad judgment call. It could be racist because there's, I can't judge a person's heart. They might be racist. I can't judge the heart, but sometimes the actions speak louder. <laughs> and, uh, and in the event when some, something like that does come up, uh, what are your procedures? How do you deal with employees um, who, who you can see they're going to they're gonna cause you problems? Because I know you guys are small business owners. Last thing you need is, I think like Marcel said, less people coming in and spending money. You do want people to come and spend money, although I'm not going to spend money in any of your places. But, uh, but I know that's, you're, you're about doing business, and you want to do business, you, you run small businesses, and it's, small business is not easy. Uh, how do you deal with those employees? Fire them. They're not part of our business. It's not part of our business model or our belief. Have you guys had to fire people like that in the past? I did in a few bars I worked in Dallas, for sure, but not here in Fort Worth. I, can, I would like to say that, you know, even though I'm a retailer, I still have to deal with the overflow from people at the bars. And we do um, sometimes not allow people on, a, on a, a regular basis, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, to come into our retail establishment. And it's incredibly hard. And we, I, you know, it took me, I probably interviewed 100 security people for my, as my parking lot attendant before I found someone that would be appropriate to represent my business and the level of service that I like to give to my customers. And it's, you know, he's in his 50s, he's got kids, you know, he, he's, he's lived life quite a bit. And it's very hard. I mean, when you think about safety and, you know, because I have all women, young women that work for me, and then at that hour of the evening, and you have a lot of people that are drinking, and we, we ask people or deny entry to people, as many white people as, in, as ethnic people, uh, for misbehaving or not dressed properly or not having you know, their shoes on or anything like that. But it's really hard because um, uh, when you're in that situation, a lot of people that work for us are younger people. They don't always make the best decisions. And they, they do the best they can with, while trying to follow the rules. And uh, sometimes they, they, um, you can't foresee how they're going to interpret those rules under a stressful situation. But, um, you know, that, that's our, our experience. I mean, on a, I mean, I can answer the phone every Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday going, what, what do we do about this? And I'm like, well, that's crazy. I never even thought about that, you know? And, and I mean, I've even had friends where I've had to call and say, I'm sorry, but you're not welcome in my store if you've had any type of alcohol consumption whatsoever. And those are people that I know. And, I mean, it's just not okay to behave that way. So I, I, um, I think it's, it's, it's a really difficult job, especially if you're um, hiring people in that pay range and that age range for them to, to make um, all the best decisions in the world and, uh, and represent uh, the values of the actual owner, and I think when people make mistakes, it's it doesn't represent the entire business, but you know it just does represent that they've made a mistake, and it's how we fix it that uh, matters. Walter and then Katie. Yes, I've got a couple of questions. What do you consider the average age of your clientele? Between like 25 and 40. 
I would agree with that. Okay. And are you aware that uh, Jordan also make tennis shoes just for comfort shoes, it's not a basketball shoe? Yes. So you deny those two? Uh, not all the time. Sometimes, if it's a, like I said, sometimes uh, when it's an all white shoe or an all black shoe is more of our focus. Well, you know, there's a difference in focus on what groups of kids actually buy those shoes, right? I, I, I do, I, and I know we'll get it wrong sometimes. I agree with you. Uh, uh, An African American kid or Hispanic kids who are mostly poor? Well, you know, the African American kids, Hispanic kids, and Asian kids in the gangs do wear those shoes. They're popular. So that's, yeah. 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 yeah, but there are, there, are, there are different types of shoes. There is. And, then, and again, you know, five years ago, we didn't include Air Force Ones, but now we include Air Force Ones. You see what I'm saying? Sometimes it changes, it just depends. Ms. LeBlanc, you mentioned in your opening, you said that sometimes we feel like and we don't get the news like we should get it sometimes because maybe we feel like because we've got an ad someplace, they owe us something, but you used the term, you were ambushed. Why would you use that term? When I, when I read the article, I felt like it was a very one-sided article. I mean, I, I just, that, that was my, my opinion, was that, I, I, not me personally, but I felt like the business owner was ambushed because they've worked um, with Fort Worth Weekly on lots of, uh, on several projects and with advertising, you know, we, I, and so have I at some point in time. And I just thought it was not a well-rounded article, was my opinion. I'm, I'm sorry. I read it in the Star Telegram. I, I read it the first article that I read. I don't know what the chronological order of of uh, reporting was and what, but the first one that I read was in the Fort Worth Weekly, and you know my point was that um, was that um, not that James is. I, it never even occurred to me to think that they, as a as business owners, were racially profiling. You know that that was my that was the point that I meant to get across. Having worked with those guys when they moved into the area, that I, I, I it just never occurred to me that they would be racially profiling. That was not my first thought. Okay, given your uh, emphasis and your description of the difficulty of hiring a proper security guard for your business, and finding someone that understood and would uphold the values of the owners. Let me ask you two gentlemen, uh, since her business is slightly different from yours, who is responsible for enforcing this dress code on a day-by-day, hour-by-hour, night-by-night basis? How are they hired and what kind of training are they given? Well, the dress code isn't enforced all the time because 97% of the time we don't even have door guys. So anybody's able to walk in. So uh, when you decide when to enforce it and when not to? We do it on the weekends when it's most popular because in our, in our experience, the, the people that are coming to start trouble or coming to prey on our customers, and they do, they're gonna dress a certain way. And does that mean they don't come in when we don't have door guys? They do come in, I notice that too. But when we have those kinds of crowds, you have to be careful and and it, and it and it it jumps up on Fridays and Saturdays when we have door guys. So how do you hire your door guys and how do you train them? We hire door guys based on people that walk in and apply for the job, based on relationships we've had with other bars, uh, and then it's the dress code we put in front of them, and then they sit with Fort Worth PD as well. Fort Worth PD, when we have door guys, Fort Worth PD is always present, always. We never have a door guy and Fort Worth PD is not working hand in hand with them. So they work together with Fort Worth PD and the city and, and let me put it this way. The two officers I've had at Whiskey Garden for three years on Fridays are Hispanic. The two officers I had at Whiskey Garden for three and a half years on Saturdays are African American. I seriously can tell you those are some strong willed men and they're not gonna tolerate any kind of behavior discriminatory at all. They won't, they don't put up with it. 
But they do recognize there are some dangerous people that are trying to get into our bars. And they help us point those men out. Just one last question. So there's no formal training of your poor guys? Like I said, we discuss it. We discuss it at length every single shift. In, in regards to formal training, uh, it, obviously we have meetings with them. When they're hired, we don't just go, okay, here's a list to go to the door. Right. Yeah, so I want to make sure you understand that. They do get training. We'll, we'll sit down with them and have meetings you know, for a couple hours right off the bat once they're hired. Uh, and then we'll do refresher training on a continuous basis. And, pro and primarily we'll do that whenever a new person comes in, we'll usually set them all down as a group. Uh, we're very fortunate we don't have a lot of turnover at the front. Um, and because uh, basically we have three people that handle, you know, Fridays and Saturday nights and, and, and a Thursday also. So we don't have a, a real large door staff. So communication, is, you know, is, is pretty easy. Uh, and, it's, uh, and, and, it's, and it's a constant thing all the time. Uh, our managers on a nightly basis are probably talking with our doorman yeah. continuously throughout the night because it's a very, it's very moving, very fluid situation. And they check when with you, us. Oh, they check with us the whole night. Yeah, We're all get, mic'd up. They ask. Uh, they ask every night, is this okay? Is this not okay? Uh, so it's a continual communication about the very subject yeah, honestly, every single shift. On a Saturday night, uh, you know, it's uh, it, during you know peak season when school's in and so forth. I mean, it's not uncommon. It, it's a bar hopping area. You know, the West Seventh is a real bar hopping area, and when you have a bar that's located miles from people, you're not going to deal with a lot of the issues that we do here. But you know, when you have, you know, I don't know, 15, 16 bars that are all in a very close area, most most people don't go into a bar and hang out all night in, in the West Seventh area. They're going to stop and have a cocktail at, you know, a half a dozen bars throughout the evening. I, it, it, so it's definitely a bar hopping area. And when you have that, you have to be in, you'll have a thousand people come through your door in a four hour period of time. And when you have something that's, you know, when you have a, you know, three, four thousand square foot, you know, building max and you have a thousand people that are coming through in four hours between the hours of, well, let's call it three and a half between 1030 and two, it gets crazy. It gets crazy, and, uh, and, and it's not easy. It's really not easy, and do we get things right all the time? Uh, obviously not. It's, 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 there's, too much, uh, uh, there's just too much going on to get it perfect every single time. The only thing that I can assure you from the, from the, bar, from the bar owners that I know, uh, I can't think of anybody that's, that's doing anything to discriminate. Um, and I can't answer for all the bars or all the people. I'm not, in their, uh, I'm not in their meetings, but I just think that the West Seventh area is one of the most diverse places that I've seen in, in Fort Worth in all my years here. And, uh, and there's everybody in the world is coming into these bars. Everybody is. And we encourage everybody to come by. I mean, come look for yourselves. I'm not going to convince you with my words. Honestly, I'm not. I'm not naive to that. Come by and see for yourself. You're more than welcome to. Or if you want to get online, you can get online in Instagram Whiskey Garden. There's 5,700 pictures. You can look at those photos yourself. Instagram any of the bars. I'm confident that any of the bars are going to represent all cultures and all backgrounds. I can definitely tell you from an African American perspective that in the black community, a lot of blacks do not want to come to the West 7th area because of the way they've been treated at some point or another. I will not say it's your location, but in the black community, we do not come. I won't say we, because I don't, I, I'm going to come, and I might come undercover. Don't wear Jordan. I might put on some Jordans and just come see. But I, I just, just to let you know. Okay. We've, heard, we've heard that, too. We're, I, 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 we're aware of that. We're yes, aware. And, and you saying that the West 7th area is the most diverse, I'm going to respectfully disagree with that statement because I just, I, I've seen it. Um, I do, I have hung out. I live downtown, so I have hung out down there on the weekends. I see it. It's not the most diverse, okay, on the weekend. Again, I can, we can respectfully disagree. But again, just knowing, just let you know, the African-American community, a lot of African-Americans do not come down to the West 7th area because of the way they've been treated at one point or another. And, now, a lot of them do, and a lot of them do. I mean, we do. We have regulars that are African American. Okay. Well, we'll look at the bottom. I would say just a caveat off of what you said. I, I have been there. I've been there with uh, police officers who are predominantly Hispanic. We've gotten kicked out for crazy, crazy things. 
And I will say majority of the time we go, uh, we run into more issues with fraternity type boys or groups, guys, oh, sure. khaki shorts, polo shirts, we excuse ourselves. I don't see anything in here saying Jordans, Timberlands, and whatever shoes they were, Sperry's or flip flops or whatnot. And then also I wanted to say something about you mentioning clean Jordans. I feel like anybody who goes out for a night on the town wants to look clean. You want to have clean shoes. No, on. I, I understand that. And, and again, it, it, sometimes it is subjective, but it's it's not it, it's not you know it's it's not a science. You know. And, I, I just don't see just being observant. I just don't see a lot of those groups of people being denied at the door, and a lot of them are. I can tell you this, the, majority, the majority of the people we turn away are college students. We're not a college bar. I don't want to be a college bar. I don't care for their, those kids' behavior either. I, I'll be honest with you. Yeah, that's what, I won't go because of that, but I'm just yeah. saying I don't see them. I'll tell you this. If I see a group of the kids you described coming up, and they're just a little boisterous, and they're loud, and they're, I, I turn them away. I don't have to give them a reason. I'm just like, you're not welcome. And I do it a lot. Well, number one, thank you all for being here with us to discuss this. I know that you've had an earlier meeting with Fernando, you had one with you all, the Seventh Street Bar Association, and you all coming to talk to us because we do want to work with our, our community business owners uh, so that we can all strive and create workforce you know, opportunities for individuals, but also a place for everyone to be able to go out and enjoy, whether it's a cocktail, a dinner, or whatever over there on 7th Street. I live over there in So 7, and so I drive through there all the time. And I do see diversity there, I just don't know where they're going, uh, because I'm seeing them on the street as I'm driving, walking to and from. So I have seen the diversity that you're talking about, uh, but again, I don't know where they're going. Uh, but, you know, bottom line is that we want to thank you for taking the time out to visit with us and uh, we look forward to working with you all to make, you know, our West Seventh area a more successful business area. Can I say something in closing? Um, my email, my contact, that's my direct cell number. If any of y'all want to get in touch with me, have an issue, you want to discuss, or if you think, do you think you should change this, I'm willing to listen to that and y'all can, y'all can contact me directly and I would love to hear your feedback. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. What, what percent of your business is minorities? I'd like for you to. Oh no, I don't. Can I look at that? Don't, if, you would, count. if you would look at that. Yeah. Uh, just just begin to kind of look at that because. I would I would say that in in, in the the cross section of minorities in my business is probably greater than the population of America. The percentages are greater. As we uh, will do our work here, uh, I think you know that we are uh, race and culture focused and uh, want to make sure that there's equity everywhere. And that's such a big area now, starting sure. out small is huge now, and reflects on all of your work. Absolutely. So when you have people who come in from out of town and you want to go and take them to somewhere that's vibrant, you know, they're not going to hit Angelo's every time. They're going <laughs> to hit 7th okay. Street. And so I think the responsibility is there as a part of this community, and, and I would like to respectfully request that you begin to put a system in place where you, you do know the answers to these questions. You know, what is the percent of your business? And if they walked away from your business, what would that impact be? I accept that responsibility. I do that. Me too. Uh, I think the impact would be large. The Human Relations Commission to provide us that. that Absolutely. Okay. Thank, Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. On our agenda is discussion of the West Police Office Association and the role of police community relations. Manny, uh, Manny Ramirez is the new president of the Fort Worth PLA and he's here to visit with us today. And before he gets started, I know the elephant in the room is is one of the recommendations that we've been looking at as a citizens advisory uh, committee. Uh, so we may hear some things about that. Many may not. I don't know. Uh, but uh, you know, we're here to listen, observe, and then discuss with them uh, some opportunities so that we can make the right recommendations going forward. So Manny, I'll let you introduce your.
Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Manny Ramirez. I'm the new president of the Fort Worth Police Officer Association. Uh, joining me is uh, Vice President Carolyn Gilmore and uh, Nestor Martinez. He's a board member of the Fort Worth POA, and he's also the president of the uh, INLEO, our, our Latino Peace Officer Association. Um, I'm, I'm glad Fernando invited us up here. Um, I was happy to, uh, to accept the invitation, and uh, Jay also extended an invitation. Um, while ordinarily you would expect the POA to be a bit apprehensive to, to come to something like this, um, I, I didn't understand why. I mean, I, I absolutely get that as a representatives of our police officers, as the body of our police officers, um, we have to have a conversation. We've got to have a voice in this conversation. So, I mean, I'm, I'm happy you guys invited us, and uh, I mean, we're, we're open to questions. I would like to ask the question of how does the POA work with uh, any of the training programs that consist with diversity uh, of the police force, of hiring, but also on how to deal with issues uh, that are, you know, whether it's an African American community, uh, Hispanic community, any ethnic groups. How do you work with them, the cultural differences in training them? So, so training is primarily the responsibility of, of admin, of management, of our chief's office and our training division and all that. But at our POA, um, we have quite a bit of involvement in our communities nowadays. Um, we, we've actually taken, this is the first year we've ever put in our budget actually money for community outreach to get involved in our communities. Um, the, it never was there before. And you'd have officers do individual acts that, that uh, they just felt out of the kind, kindness of their heart to do in their communities. But now, um, as a body, we've recognized that we have to have that um, community outreach because the more the greater involvement we have as as an association in our community that's the less complaints officers are going to have that's less physical confrontations they're going to have because they see us out there and they see us as equals because we see our our, our community as equals also um, so I think that's a shift that we're really we're really trying to push uh, this leadership team in our POA and and I think that it's it's been really effective over the last few months uh, I, I've seen a, a great shift in how, in how it, it's operated from years past. So, I mean, I'm glad with what I've seen, and I think we're, we're just building on it. Walter? Well, number one, I appreciate you guys being here. Uh, I know that one of the things that uh, we're dealing with, and we would really want to, and I'm not going to ask a lot of questions here, but we've been trying to contact you guys to come and meet with our committee for several times, and we haven't gotten that. And so I know if you've seen, uh, our interim report, there's a lot of significant things there and we visit with other parts of your organization, but you guys have not come to visit with us yet. So we'd like to, we don't have time to do it here. It's too much in depth, but we'd like to make sure that you guys understand when we meet again or at least accept our invitation to come and visit and sit down and visit with us with our committee on criminal justice. Can we get that commitment from you? Oh, yes, sir. I mean, and I, I think that there's a lot of things that we've got to talk about with, with whether it be our city leaders, whether it be our community leaders, whether it be committees that are put together from our city leaders, we've, we've got to have a hand in that conversation. So um, I, I don't recall turning down an invitation. If we did, I apologize. Um, but th this is the first invitation I've gotten personally to come to this task force. Um, I'll, speak on I'll, I'll accept that. But I just want to make sure that we will be calling on you again because we want to go with each entity, the things that we're finding, we're, we're trying to find out from each group how they feel about it and, and what some of the, you know, how do we resolve some issues, okay. And Walter, going forward, we will be hearing from the Black POA and the Hispanic POA also in the future. Yeah, we, yeah, we, we have initially tried to set those meetings up individually in our task force, and I was kind of surprised that it was a meeting as a whole versus meeting our criminal justice committee. That's what's kind of news to us. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'd like to comment on that if you don't mind. And once again, my name is Carolyn Gilmore, and I've been a uh, Fort Worth officer for 21 years. I live in the city. I was born here in this city. So thank you for serving to make it better. Um, I wanted to comment on that, on that invitation, sir. No, no, it's on. Um, we were going through an election process, so Manny was not brought up to speed on that. Now, <clears throat> I spent 12 years in patrol, nine years on the east side, three years on north side, all midnight patrol. I spent eight years in narcotics, 
I purchased street level narcotics and worked all the way up to the DEA. I'm currently assigned to the gang unit, but before I came to the gang unit for a year and a half, I was one of the procedural justice instructors. I taught PJ2 and PJ3. As a, in my, uh, also I was, my peers elected me knowing I'm teaching PJ, knowing I'm behind that message, training our officers, and I'll give you a little personal background. Um, I'm, 16 years ago, I married a fellow officer, and he was, he's a black man. I was able to share some stories about implicit bias, just things that officers didn't realize really happened. And, and just today, we had lunch today, and the waitress asked if we needed to split the check. And I said, no, we're married. He's paying for all of it. <laughs> now, she's not a, she wasn't a racist, but she had whatever implicit bias she had that perhaps we were on a business lunch. It's happened several times. We'll walk into a restaurant, and they'll look at me and say, just one? And I know he's with me. He's paying. Things like that, being able to share that with fellow officers and them say, I had no idea that that happens. So back to the invitation. I'd, exchanged several emails with Ty and actually had an opportunity to talk to him on the phone for about an hour one morning and I told him I'd like to pump the brakes on that because I have to admit and to these guys we were friends before we got into the association stuff we've never had those awkward hard conversations amongst each other the POA boards we haven't we all go eat lunch we all go hang out we tell little stories but if we really had an awkward, hard conversation on what each person from each organization is feeling and what their perceptions are. And so my apologies to this task force for delaying that meeting, but I felt it was necessary that we had that conversation amongst our membership before we came here speaking about how someone feels when we really haven't even posed those awkward questions. It is awkward. That, that sort of defeats our purpose. In a way, because we've gotten together to talk about things that we don't get a little clear understanding of how each one of you felt in, in group felt individually. So that really defeats our purpose of what we're we're trying the information we're trying to get. Because one thing about bringing together, you may do some things right now to bring yourself together, but you're really not because we don't know what the real facts are. Now. We are together. We are more together. My my point being, 20 years ago, a female married to a black man officer get elected overwhelmingly by the membership I, and my two opponents were white males and so that was a huge step i'm sorry but my point is just that that uh, we would hope that we as we met we met individually that we could get their each each group's perspective as to where they are currently now and so if that's something that y'all are working on, y'all really come together because when I look and I read the Star Telegram, it doesn't seem like y'all are together because they're different versions. Star Telegram doesn't get it right. Well, we're talk, so we're talking well, about Well, you know, I, don't, I, I think they're here to meet with us, to talk with us so that we can start a conversation, but I've also heard them say that they're willing to meet with your committee, Ty. And I think that would go for the other two POAs I'm probably talking about. I think the invitation was a wake-up call that our conversation amongst each other was long yeah. overdue. Yeah. Yes, I just wanted just to be clear. Uh -huh. uh, Officer Martinez and Sergeant Martin, they were all on, you know, receptive to meeting the individual. I believe me and Officer Martinez, we exchanged email and maybe had a phone call as well. And I think uh, Officer Gilmore, correct me if I'm mistaken, uh, wanted to get together with the other two uh, police officer associations, y'all have a talk and then come back together and meet with our task as our individual uh, committee. Was that, I think that's how everything took place. So I want to make sure that it is clear that an invitation was extended and accepted on behalf of all the respective organizations. Uh, but um, at that point, I think they wanted to all collectively talk prior to coming together. Is that? Is that yeah, I think realistically, and I'll kind of touch on that, Ty, if you don't mind. Um, we are one POA. So we, we are one bargaining unit, the Fort Worth POA. Now, we also have um, the BPOA, and we also have the LPOA by different names now. But we are one body. And I think we've actually fought that internal battle to become one body again. 
because those groups were formed because officers didn't feel like they had fair representation throughout the POA. So to, to further divide and say we want to speak to each group individually, now I understand it's a fact-finding mission. I, I completely understand, and I apologize for, for uh, messing that up. But for our purpose, this board's purpose, our, our POA board's purpose, we're trying to bring everyone together ourselves. So to have that conversation together was important for us because we are one POA. I think add to that too, just for everyone's aware, uh, Sergeant Martin, who's the president of the BPO, he sits on your board yes. as well. So yes. they all are on the same POA board. So that's that was my question. What is the one side? Oh, go ahead. go ahead. That was my question. My next question was, what is the, you mentioned that the other POAs were formed because there was not representation from, from the main POA. And you're trying to make that feel like it's one again. But we do know that there are issues and concerns from each one of those groups. So for us to be able to talk to each one of those groups individually, there might be some things said individually that won't be said collectively. Just, just to add on that, um, <clears throat> this has been at least a 10-year a uh, process for us to come to this point to where we are sitting on the board. And when I say that, you know, I've been a president for at least six years prior to my election now, but there was issues then, and we've been quoted in the paper. We've, we've had discussions with chiefs, with, uh, you know, against police chiefs, this and that and the other. But to where we're at now, it's, it's very unique because we were never there in the past. So as far as us kind of delaying, if, if that's what you... Uh, say that we were doing, we weren't delaying it. We were just trying to get to the point where we understood what this panel was about and what we were trying to accomplish as a mission internally with our department. Now, you can ask us all day long about how our association feels, and I'm gonna answer that, but keep in mind that it's very unique and dynamic now as far as where we're at as far as a POA board and an NLEO board and a BPOA board because we do have members on, as a matter of fact, Manny's a member of my association, and Carolyn is as well, too. So that kind of gives you a little bit of how, how that works. So, so right now you're looking at the first Hispanic ever elected to the executive board of the POA, the first female. We have the first black female, who's also our secretary now, in the, in the executive board. We have, I believe it's three African-American members uh, of the POA board of directors that are elected by their peers. And uh, two, 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 two other women. Two other women. Um, I mean, so so we're diverse. If you look at boards past, just look five years ago, and it's not there. You look ten years ago, and it's even further away. Now, I don't want to say that 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 it was a problem back then and all that, but that's part of the reason why we're here. Is we have to sit there and have that conversation and recognize that there were reasons why those organizations were formed because it used to be one POA, and then it had to split. So that's sort of, and, and I think it's telling that we got elected by our peers and everybody knew full well that, that I had come up in the NLEO organization, but yet I'm elected president of the Fort Worth POA. I think everybody understood that we are one POA. We are one body of officers and we have to represent everyone fairly. Black, white, purple, pink, it doesn't matter. If you're a cop and you wear the badge, we represent you equally now. Uh, what is the POA's position and stance on the Citizen Review Board? I uh, See, I think that, that question, I would like to have that at a different time. I mean, I think, I don't know if I could give that a, a just answer without facts and, and talking to the, to the membership in depth about it. Um, anything that we would say would be personal opinion, and we represent a body. So I think if we had a meeting about that separately offline, um, or maybe come back together at another time and talk about that issue, uh, I think that that'd be more appropriate. I, I don't want to. I don't want to shortchange the answer that I would give. Well, I, I was, what I wanted to do is I want to clarify a few things just so you make sure, you, just so you know what you're listening to. When Mr. Dansby asked about when he said it defeats the purpose, what we were looking for is what are the differences between the three POAs, and so wanting to meet with each one, and then and then sit back and say, okay, well, here are the differences. So you've already done that, but I wanted to make sure you knew that that was where he was going when he said it's already, you know, you've already completed the purpose. Oh, yes. uh, and congratulations on pulling that together. 
I guess my main uh, question goes to uh, Officer Gilmore, and it has to do with who, who, who do the police officers work for? Who do they see as their customers? The citizens, 100%. You know, and thank you for that. On the back of all the cars, it says protect and serve. Yes, sir. And, and most of the things that we hear, either anecdotally or people have bought following that got us to where we are, and y'all know where, you know where we are, has to do with that not being translated into the field. So, and the other thing is, this is the way we train, but then the older guys say that's the way you got trained, but here's how we really do it. So what is the plan to deal with some of that as you train? Are you talking about when the rookies get in the field and they're told, hey, that's not the way we do it? They call them the old heads, just so you know. Yes. I think any job that you do, when you go through training and you're, you're, you're given books to read and you go through the motions of things that you're supposed to do and then you get into the actual position there's always going to be a co-worker that tries to teach you how to uh, work smarter not harder and my explanation for that is those officers such as myself i was a field training officer i trained people a lot of times based on my experience and what was actually going on in the field when you're in the field training someone, you have to remind the young officers coming out, they're no longer in a controlled environment. Everything that they do at the academy, all the patrol scenarios, all the officer survival scenarios, they're in a controlled area. They're in a controlled situation. The simulation is not going to kill them. The punches in the face are not going to kill them. But when you're in the field, you have to let them know and make them aware that you're no longer in a controlled environment. Now, by no, no means do I condone misconduct or feel like anybody should. It's not fair to any officer to teach them uh, a shortcut that's not by policy. You're not doing anybody any favors. I don't think anyone supports that. If you can do your job easier and still adhere to policy, then you're pretty good at this job. And I will, and I will applaud our, our our chiefs office and our management team for the the new FTO program that they've gone through in the last few years. Is they link up with NPOs, neighborhood patrol officers, while they're going through field training. So these rookies aren't getting cut loose and being sent out with an old salty dog patrol guy to tell them how it's done. He's actually going riding with a neighborhood patrol officer on the front end and back end of his deployment to find out what community policing is all about before they start taking those hot calls and being being exposed to, to the real nitty-gritty of police work. So I think that that's a shift that's happened in the last few years, and I've actually seen it in, in some officers. I just came out of the detective's office, and I've seen it. The attitudes of some officers in the last five years has been much different than the previous five years. Yeah, and I'll add to that, too. I'm myself in my MPO in North Division, and, and getting those rookies right out of the academy and bringing them into our field of expertise which is basically working with the community that we serve every day, whether it be going to these meetings, whether it be going to schools, whether, uh, you know, different concerns within a neighborhood, that's what we show them first, uh, to get them to understand that it's not all about just putting people in jail and going after the criminals that are, uh, that are there, but you deal with citizens that have regular complaints, everyday complaints that are of all, um, of all diversities, of all of all uh, ethnic backgrounds, so that gives them a time to kind of slow down a little bit and think about what they're doing, and that they do have to treat people uh, like they would like to be treated. All right, and then uh, okay. Um, just quickly, thank you. If I'm if not if I'm not mistaken, the reason there are members from the other associations on your board is coming out and meeting confirmed. You did that because you were going to be the one group that was going to be the uh, bargaining group, right. and that required having those members on the board, right? Uh, I wasn't around whenever that first contract was negotiated, but I, I don't think that it was a requirement, no. We were, they were already the sole bargaining agent, I believe. Right, but, but in order to be more acceptable as a bargaining agent, you needed them on, on the board, as I recall. No, if, if the, way, the way things happened when, when NLEO first started back in 2004, 
we saw a lot of things that the POA wasn't providing our uh, Hispanic community. We went out and we ventured and uh, Chief Ramirez was actually one of the ones that started the organization back in the day and we wanted more of a fraternal organization. We knew that the labor organization was gonna be strong. We needed that body as just one within our department, but we wanted a little bit more within our organization. So that's why we formed. I was just going to say, no, under the meeting confer, uh, there was no requirement of representation, but um, that was actually a voluntary act done by the Police Officers Association right about the time that, um, that there started to be outcry from our LPOA and our BPOA Correct. about issues uh, that they were having that they did not feel that the POA was addressing. Correct. And, and over time, we uh, obviously the meeting confers uh, brought up. So, yes. Okay, I, I, didn't, I didn't want to you know, leave that point. I just want to ask this one quick question. And first of all, I mean, congratulate, I want to say congratulations for your election. Thank you. Uh, and, and I totally expect you to be a token, even though I feel that in some ways the POA felt it necessary, they needed a change <laughs> at the top. <laughs> and, and that's good. But I want to know is, how does the POA assess the leadership of the chief of police? Are you asking for an assessment? I mean, you, you've already given one, haven't you, publicly? Have you given an assessment of what you think of the chief of police, your organization? I have not, I don't believe. I'm talking about the organization. Oh, the organization, yes. yes. So, so have the they voted on something? Oh, you're talking about the survey that was sent out? Whatever. I mean, how, how do you access the chief of police's performance? Was it done on the prior POA's leadership or was something done with... Yeah, that was last year. That was that on was the prior. Year. That was prior leadership. on the but, it, but it was the POA. Yes. I mean, and you were members of it. Yes. And listen, I'm, I'm not going to take the opportunity to cop out. I'll give you my opinion. And that's, what I'm, <laughs> that's what I'm asking. <laughs> Partially just because you called me token. But... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Not be a token. You said he was not. But he, he was a token, yes. Well, the, the, you, then you heard it differently than a lot of the Latinos in this room heard it. Because we heard it as he was a token. I heard it. Yes. You, you didn't hear that. <laughs> 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 it didn't have to clarify. We all felt it. Yes. To, to come back around. And, the, and this is a. And this is a. Uh, and, and this is a personal opinion. All right. In any in any leadership team, any leadership ships, you know, tenure, they're going to have failures and they're going to have successes, okay? Um, now, I wasn't the leader of this organization whenever all of the voting was going on and all of the, the high-profile incidents or those things, but I will tell you this, ever since I did take over, we've had a few high-profile incidents, and they've been handled 180, degree, 180 degrees different. Um, just in, in the latest one, uh, where was that over in east side whenever the police department came out and, and released that body cam footage right away um ordinarily what would what would you have expected the poa to do though bob ray would you have expected us to agree with that decision probably not in the past but but yet we did um, because we recognized that in that instance um it was already out there the the narrative had been painted and the only way to reverse course is to put it all out there and to, and to actually give the right side, um, or the, the, the whole side. So I, I think cooperation is important between management and labor, and I think in the past, there hasn't been that. Now, that, that's not to say that I think that, that everything that the administration's done is perfect. I don't think that at all. I think that everybody has, that there's been some mistakes, there's been some missteps, and, and obviously everybody's seen those, and everybody's pointed to those. And there'll probably continue to be. No matter who's in charge of the department, there will always be. Um, I'm always going to make missteps as, as the leader of this organization. So right now, I, I think we're focused on what we're trying to build and less focused on trying to poke holes in other folks' performance. Um, we're focused on coming together as an association and focusing on ourselves. So I, I don't want to come up here and, and get on my soapbox and talk about 
things that have gone wrong. I want to talk about some things that we're doing right. Well, with that said, you led to my next question. If y'all have already met, you've had some discussions. What are some of your priorities and goals that you've got as a, as a group together? As a group, realistically, it's just expand that community outreach. Uh, like I said, it's, it's spreading throughout our officers. They see how this board's operating, and they elected us for a reason, like I said. They see how we're operating, and they see that we value that community participation as an association, and we recognize that it's important. And it's also coming to that end around to where all officers in our organization feel like they're welcome. Um, that there, shouldn't, there should never be the time where somebody says, oh, well, I have to call Nestor because Manny's not going to represent me, or I have to call Rod because Manny's not going to give me a fair shake. That that should never happen in our organization. Well, you said community outreach. I'm talking about as far as community relations. What is, what are some of the uh, what are some of the I guess the goals that you may have there? I mean, obviously you've gotten some as a whole you've gotten some bad press over the whole year. And so, how do you address that to have make the get the community feeling back and comfortable with with the former police department? Well, it's one step at a time. And and I'll tell you, we're already taking those steps. Just last week. Uh, they were having complaints over in the Stop 6 area. They were having complaints that folks were flooding the streets and, and causing traffic hazards and nobody was, nobody was able to walk and it was dangerous for the kids around there. So the management over there, the, the sergeants, lieutenants and all that, they were discussing strategies of how to shut that down, you know. Do we, do we go and stop everybody from walking and all that? Well, it was actually a POA member who, who called me and said, Manny, I have a good idea. I think that perhaps we can insert ourselves into this situation, let's set up a grill, and let's make ourselves part of this community event that they're having on Sundays, and let's cook food for everybody in the community. How do you feel about that? And I said, well, it's going to cost about a thousand bucks, but let's do it, and let's see how it, how it works. And it worked well. I was, I was thinking more so along the line of a strategic plan or a long-range plan that maybe you all are talking about. One of, one of our things that we've always been uh, really strong on promoting is um, diversity within our department and promoting people like yourselves to actually encourage the young people of our community to sign up for our department and apply and actually do the work that's required out here in these communities. So that way the city of Fort Worth Police Department does match the diversity of the city that it's serving. So that's, I mean, that's what we try to promote constantly. We give scholarships and we do all sorts of stuff for schools and uh, give back as much as we can, but without the citizens' help and without leaders like you guys, promoting our department and encouraging, like I said, these young people to go in that are right out of college to apply for our department. If they have a, a, a calling for service, then we're gonna be able to provide that for them. Not only just, we shouldn't, in my opinion, we shouldn't have to go to other states. We shouldn't have to go to other cities, as a matter of fact. We should be able to pick up our officers here within the city of Fort Worth. And I think that's all of our jobs to, to promote that as well. And a lot of that's just, it, it, it goes back to the core function of why a POA exists, and that's working conditions and, and trying to promote a good working environment here. And the better your working environment is, the better you can draw f good folks to work here. We want our officers to live here and work here. I think 40% of our department doesn't even live in the city. I mean, I think that's an accurate statistic, and that's, and that's outrageous. So, so the issue is how do, we, how do we get those folks to come back to our community and live, live where they work? And like I said, at the end of the day, we're a labor organization, and we, we exist to protect the rights of our members. And I think it's sort of an end around process to, to benefit our membership by doing community outreach. When it, that's not the obvious solve, right? The obvious solve is when somebody comes out and says an officer did something wrong, you stand up and you beat your chest and you say, no, he did nothing wrong. But I don't think that's how you operate in 2018. You can't do that because you can't defend bad behavior. You can only defend due process rights. That's it. I got one other question. Uh, you talked about recruiting. Uh, what methodology are you going to use recruiting? You said out of college, but when, would you, when, when did you start as an officer? I mean, where did, when did you get involved? I've been, myself, I've been in the department for 17 years. I started right out of the military. So, yeah, that's, that's when I started. I can't speak for you. My, my question would be then, what are the plans as far as your recruitment? Do you think you should be starting a little bit earlier, like what we've seen in our plan, of even something like what, what we used to have? We used to have a, a cadet program or something that, yeah. that where they actually worked with youngsters, yeah. helped them go through to at least two years of college, and then uh, go into the uh, workforce. 
Yeah, I think that, that, that cadet program is fantastic. And I was actually a cadet when I was coming up. So the, the program works, obviously. Um, and I think we're actually starting a little earlier with PAL programs and just exposing the youth in our communities to our profession. I think that that's an important piece that we've already started doing. Um, now, now, to take it a little further, I think we also have to talk about staffing issues. So officers don't want to come here and work so hard because they know they're spread so thin. So if you want to recruit folks and show them it's a good place to work, you've got to have, have enough officers to, to fill those ranks too. Because, I mean, we're short staffed. Let me ask you this. How many recruiters do you think we have full time? For a city of our size, yeah, that's that's that doesn't make sense to me. I want to be on the recruiting notice with what he's talking about the pilot program and having a plan for right. that place. Because if you start these kids off, and some of them, and I, I'm glad you mentioned that because I do know officers that are there are police officers that started out in the academy that are still police officers. Yeah, and, and I, the and academy has been going for quite a while. And I'll, and I'll give you something on the PAL. I'm, I'm actually a, a past board member to start the PAL that we started here in Fort Worth. But right now, we only have one officer that's dedicated to that full time. We literally have to ask people to volunteer their time to participate in that. That could be a great program if we had the, the staff for it. But yeah, our city is, is way behind on, on staff issues as far as the amount of people that live here, whether it's to come work or to come play on the weekends, we, we just don't have enough. All right, uh, anybody else have another question? I just need to make the final statement. Well, I was going to make a statement, but go ahead. Okay, well, you can have <laughs> no, a final statement, but I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I need to make the final statement because I want to make it clear <laughs> to Manny and Officer Martinez and anybody else in here, including, including you, me, yes. that, uh, first of all, if I'm going to call somebody a token, I wouldn't back into it with the negative. <laughs> wait, wait a minute, Andre. People thought that they were going to place me in position to be a token, but they were sadly mistaken. Well, let's get on the subject of what we're yeah. on. I just, well, I, well, I, I want Manny to understand that I'm, I'm proud of the fact that he is head of this organization at this time and that you have our support. Uh, needless to say, if something happens that I think ought to be criticized, I will criticize you as much as I criticize anybody else I've ever known in that position, including the last guy, whom I do not appreciate at all. That's just me. Uh, but, uh, so I just want to make it clear. I did not call you a token. Will not call you a token and we until I decide you. that you are. Oh. <laughs> and then I will let you know. Apology So I apologize if you thought that's what I was doing. Rosa. All right. Thank you uh, all for being here. And thank you for clearing that up because a lot of us heard something differently. Uh, but thank you all for being here. We want to work with you all. Uh, one of the things I would suggest, is, especially on the topic of the Citizen Advisory Committee, as you meet with the uh, Criminal Justice Committee with Ty, the, his committee members, maybe you all have a discussion with them. Uh, and I know that you will reach out also to the LPOA, the B, the Black POA as well, so that you can have that same discussion with them. So that way we hear the comments, the pluses and minuses from each of your associations, but also as one. I just have one question, and really a consideration from this group. Uh, perhaps you could prepare something, some questions that we could pose to all three of our boards respectively and come back collectively. I mean, that, that would be a huge help. Why don't you all meet with Ty first to talk about this, and then if you all decide to do some type of a C survey that goes out to your membership, then they would be between the committee and you all. That's I think the original way that we had a plan where that each three come at an individual time slot might be better served that But what I'm saying is, no, what she's asking is not not our membership, our boards. We can pull all three. Our, we have 18 on our board alone. They have five. We I'm on that association, and BPOA has about five. They're going through an election process right now. They'll have a new well, president. Talking about to do it survey of the board. No, I'm just, an open conversation of all three of our boards. Like, hey, this is what the group wants to know. How do you feel about that? The so bar yeah, list, of course. Yeah, well, that, that, and that's what I'm saying. I think if you meet with Ty, y'all can develop those questions. In his committee. Oh, so we would write our own questions? That's no, no, no. You would be the tie and then let the committee give you the questions. Oh, perfect. Well, we're, we're grateful for that and thank you for having us today. Yeah, thank you guys for your support. I mean, you guys you guys are all leaders in the community and that's why y'all are on on this this uh, this task force and, and I want to let you guys know I do respect the work that y'all are doing. I mean, I think it's good. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's really good to even have this conversation. I mean, I think you all recognize five, ten years ago this doesn't happen. So. 
I mean, it's 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 groundbreaking, and and I and I appreciate that, guys. So. Well, and, yeah. and just ca carry that message home to y'all's constituents. And that, I think, that I think officers are good. Give them a hug. Give them a handshake. Yeah, and I think I think you're well aware that you know it's taken time for us to get to this point. We've fought, fought hard for a lot of it, uh, but we are in a good place right now as far as our conversations and that dialogue that we need so so much in our city. That's all. And, and one one comment again. Thank you for being here, all of you. Uh, one comment I'd make. A couple of comments actually. You know, it takes all of us working together and all of the associations working together. I think though that the missing part is what do you need? And so go back to Walter's comments about a strategic plan, because as we finish our work, we'd like to know what is it that you really need to be able to impact the, the officers that you impact. The other thing though that I wanna talk about is getting to the heart. And as we train our police officers, they, they should live in the community with us and be our neighbors. And a lot of them are, but a lot of them aren't as you all, as you already know. But if we don't get to the heart of them, then they're gonna continue to be uh, seen in an adversarial relationship. And I would hope that as you put together your strategic plan, that you will look at how do we, how do we mend the, between the community and the, uh, the officers that are coming out? How do we create officers who feel like they have a purpose when they hit the streets? then we want them safe. We don't want to be adults. But if we continue to do what we're doing, we're putting each other at risk. <clears throat> Communities, the kids aren't embracing the officers the way they used to, and maybe we do need that cadet program started again. But just put your heart into it. You live here just like we do. And so let's just make sure that we're working together to create that community. And it, it, in Ty's work that he's doing, he's leading, there's six committees. And as he's leading that committee, if there's something that we need to elevate, he's the person who's going to bring that to our attention. And if you need some help from us, let us know what that is. And it's only through working together that we're going to get this done. But purpose-driven officers are needed right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Good afternoon. And this would be pretty quick. I will. I couldn't lift it. That's fine. Um, now that we figured out that Bob Ray heard Yanni and Rosa heard Laurel. <laughs> Good way of putting it in perspective. Well, I'm not the only one that heard that. Um, Miriam, Robert, Jennifer. <laughs> we, we were all like, what? We were all like, what? <laughs> what did he just say? What did he just say? Um, so this is really going to be pretty quick. I think you, everyone received an invitation from Fernando, and I actually went through um, this training last month, and I thought it would be a good opportunity. Police department has been uh, conducting uh, opportunities for citizens, average citizens and, and interested folks uh, to go through some of the training that they actually provide uh, their, their cadets and provide their officers. And one of them is really situational awareness and de-escalation. It's really about how to deal with, with different situations that they sometimes go through. And it's, it's not a real long uh, course. It's 
it's three hours, one to four, and it's only if you want to stay that long. The first piece is really conversation and videos where you get to see the uh, different situations that occurred that have been recorded, actual situations, and then they talk about what the officers did right, what they did wrong, what would you, any ideas from the folks that are there that could have maybe changed the way things weren't. And really, I think it, it, one thing I noticed that it, the trainers that are in the room, they actually get information from the folks that are, that are talking to them, lay people. Uh, I was in there with a lot of our city attorneys and they were asking specific legal questions you know, from their perspective. So uh, I thought it would be a good idea for anybody from the task force that might be interested in doing it. It's uh, the next one scheduled June 7th from one to four. Um, and right now we're just inviting folks from this task force. They, they don't want it to be really, really big because then it would take long. Uh, so if anybody's interested, I think Fernando sent out a, uh, an actual um, invitation. It's at the Bob Boland facility. So I was just here to reinforce that. So if anyone's interested, you might want to attend. Are we supposed to register for that? Yes, if you, just so they can have an idea of how many folks are going and get you on the list so they can let you through the. If you would respond to you. favorably to me, to the meeting notice that I sent to you, just say accept. We'll relay that information to Jay. Yeah. And Jay, I know uh, I asked Fernando this question, but that is the day of a, uh, the four chambers luncheon, and so some of us may be coming after work, so we may not be there for the full time, but we'll be Yeah, if you just let Fernando know, and then we'll get the information to, to PD about that. The, the second part of the so an hour and a half is that the second part, you actually uh, can go into the training facility and, and be put into a situation as if you were the police officer, uh, if you want to do that part. So that, uh, but I just thought it was a good, it's a good way to have a conversation about some of the training techniques that the police officers receive uh, so you can get a good idea on how that works. So I think Robert had a question. Are there other dates or uh, proposed dates that we might be able to attend? Uh, we can probably, uh, I can probably have one set up for later in the summer. Uh, but right now, that's the next one that's available. Charlie, did you? Yeah, we actually have three more dates already set. Oh, already set? Okay. We can get those out. Yeah, we'll get those out. Oh, that'd be great. Thank you. Yes. So you'll get those to Fernando? So you yes. Can those dates right out to Thank you, Charles. We got 40 of those. That's all I had. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Nice. Um, next on the agenda is update on leadership training. Fernando and Estrus. I can, I can comment briefly on leadership training for city officials, uh, for uh, the city council, uh, one of the officials and assistant city managers, as well as department heads, and assistant directors of the city departments. We've had one round of training already. I think uh, those who have attended the training will tell you that it's uh, hard hitting uh, and uh, direct. Uh, we're going through a second round of training. Uh, the uh, City Council will be training uh, all day, 9 to 4, on uh, Tuesday, uh, May 29th. That's a week from tomorrow. It's under uh, all, uh, Public safety conflict. Uh, sir? It's under tab 2. Yes. Uh, the agenda has been posted. Uh, and the third round will be uh, June 14th uh, for the City Council. One official assistance event. So, uh, the comments we've received so far from the council members, as well as from the department heads and assistant directors, have been generally positive. Uh, I won't say that they've been unanimously positive. There have been some folks who uh, have, uh, have not responded uh, favorably to, to, the, uh, uh, to the directness of the training. Uh, that's something that we can reasonably expect. Uh, and uh, I think it shows that, uh, that the training is uh, uh, addressing the difficult issues uh, in a uh, forthright manner. Uh, these issues are not easy, uh, and we don't expect uh, everyone to, uh, to react in the same way. So that's the training for the city officials. Uh, I think equally, if not more important, is the training for community leaders and interested citizens, and uh, Esther Tucker is leading the way on that front. Yeah. And you'll see on that same tab, we've had three community trainings, uh, community leaders, uh, based upon the nominations of about 39 registrants. Two small groups have been completed. These are pretty much all, all day. 
seven, eight hours. Uh, and then this past weekend, we complete the first one for interested citizens. We didn't have as many as were registered, but more than half, probably about 25. Uh, and we uh, rose in response to your invitation to city council. We actually have four council persons who indicated interest in a kind of a custom design training for their constituents. So it's Kelly and Brian and uh, Ann and Jean. Yes. No, Carlos, oh, oh, Kelsey. Carlos, Carlos, Carlos Brian, 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 Kelly, Kelly Ellen Gray, and Ann Sager. Good. They're going well, and it, again, get, drilling down into equipping them with particular leadership engagement skills, uh, involving some of the shared language around racial equity, and then looking at particular disparities and findings from the interim report. Is there is there any way that we could, I mean, doing one of our sessions, we could get a sample of what they're actually experiencing? I mean, their training. I don't think we've been exposing any training. training. The training model that the National Police Service is using. It would be it would benefit it would benefit me to know exactly what they're going, what they're covering, about what they're going through. At not a, I know we don't have time for an all day deal, but at least something of uh, 45 minutes or an hour or something on these meetings, so we can actually understand what what is going on. Because I look at this, and the last time this was brought up, uh, I did have most of the leadership agree with me. About the results or whether they, they were really being effective, and I, I just like to know what they're doing. As well, could you provide what us with some type of summary? Or are you no. talking about the National League? The, the National League for the city yeah. officials. Oh, yeah. the city right. officials. Right. But normally, we would be the first ones to go through training. So we know what everybody else is getting, but we haven't, I haven't seen anything like that myself. That's all. You're walking, you said you would stay away from their meetings, but you are welcome to attend their meetings. No, 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 I, I, to, I'm not uh, talking about their, their meetings. I'm talking about having something here where at least we're exposed to the children they're going through. Yeah, I, I said a lot of it. I was, I was expecting that to be part of the process. Um, yeah, I can attend one of these others, but... Would it behoove us to attend one of these, uh, the interested uh, residents? For the community leaders, if you want to see if you want to see the the National League of Cities training, uh, I would encourage you to attend either uh, the training for the city council or the training for the department heads or assistant directors, because the content is is similar if not identical. Uh, the discussion may be different. I'm, not, I'm, I'm just saying expose us to what they're seeing, what they're doing. That's why I was asking, is there a way of us getting a summary? Um, we can certainly provide you with summaries the value, of the yeah, training. The training. Yeah, somebody asked me if I was going and the first time blanked on it. I said, I'm sorry, what was you to say again? And then they said, you know, time is, is so precious these days yeah. that between task force subcommittees, um, you know, I'm, I'm agreeing with my colleagues here that it would just be nice to at least get the overview so we can speak on it. Speak on it. And be versed. Um, if, even if we don't go through it ourselves and a crash course format or something like that. Yeah. We'll be glad to follow up. Real quick, on, on the leadership training so that's uh, that's uh, provided by NLC for the city officials, are those three separate, uh, each class, are they different? Or are they? No, they're virtually the same. Okay. They're virtually the same. Um, as I say, the discussion may differ from one group to the next, uh, but the, the basic content is the same. The, uh, the discussion at the first meeting, for example, uh, revolves uh, mostly around the history of, uh, of racial uh, discrimination in the United States, uh, going back to colonial days uh, and uh, up to the present. And uh, yeah. how do we talk about these things? Uh, how do we adopt the common vocabulary? The next session will deal more with uh, uh, how we deliver city services in respect to uh, the, the different needs of, of uh, different people in the community. And, uh, and uh, we'll move uh, in the direction of uh, how we uh, reorient uh, city uh, uh, policies and procedures uh, in respect to, uh, to equity. And, uh, and so, uh, 
I, I think uh, I think you'll see that we're uh, discussing the hard issues. Uh, the council members, I think, will tell you that they have found the discussion to be uh, eye-opening. Uh, some have commented that they've never thought about uh, issues of race and culture in this way before. Right. Uh, so it's been uh, it's been it's been a kind of awakening for a lot of folks. We will follow up and get y'all some of that information. Uh, next is committee reports. Uh, a criminal justice. Yeah, he definitely wanted to. Well, we will reconvene. We don't maybe don't mind you, so we'll wait for this week, so we'll probably start up again uh, next month. So, love and criminal justice report email from Tad. We'll start again next month. All the files are supporting the rest of the stuff. So, he goes right on. Uh, any, any questions? Economic development, Charles? Yes. Um, we normally meet on Wednesdays. We will not be meeting this Wednesday because of conflict with uh, the place we have it. Uh, but we should meet again on the 30th. And uh, Robert Stearns, our chief uh, staff person, is um, helping to formulate recommended strategies for us that address the three areas that were the areas of findings, mm -hmm. which were uh, employment, unemployment disparities, income disparities, and then the, the number and size of, of uh, minority-owned businesses. So he's going to tailor some recommendations for us. <coughs> Education, Bob or Robert? Bob had to leave. He was so. We have continued to meet. We meet twice a month. Uh, our last two meetings in May, we have presentations from representatives from the Rainwater Foundation and the Lindsay Richardson Foundation, two organizations that fund and see a lot of education-related programs. So we're going to get their perspectives on what the community can do uh, in its own way to supplant or support some of what is already going on, and also for them to give us some ideas of things that uh, they might come across that they did not fund, but that we could take advantage of. So we got some very good information from both of those representatives. And again, we do meet twice a month, and we'll do so in June. Help. Uh, we haven't met since our new Trinity Institute conference in June. Comments on the annual report? Okay. I'm just going to say, I, I think, you know, as we move toward solutions, that's going to be it. And whether committees need more input from community folk, great. But uh, and I don't know I don't know where it's going. I mean, uh, we're going to depend on the committees to come up with recommendations that we'll all talk about and then do a final report to the council. So we're going to wait on y'all to tell us, really. As many recommendations as we want. Yeah, exactly. We, we don't want to limit. We've said that before. We do, do not want to limit any of our recommendations. We might prioritize some of them, but we don't want to leave anything out. Do we have a deadline that we're working backwards from so we can? The end of the year. <laughs> but when do we? I'm not trying to read. <laughs> I think <laughs> it, well, but. we're saying uh, probably sometime, uh, I would say in July, August time frame. So, and, and reason being is once we have those recommendations, what we want to do is go back to the community and uh, let them hear those recommendations because we want to make sure what we heard from them is things that we're recommending. Um, we're going to go back to the key stakeholders as well with that information. So that way we can come back as a group and if we need to amend anything, we will have the time frame to do that. So did you say August? So you want our recommendations on August? August. August. I, well, I'm saying July or August. Maybe yeah, we need to agree on a time frame. Maybe we need well, to talk about that. Yeah. Okay. Why, why don't you, okay, why don't you all come up with, uh, by our next month's meeting, which is in June, give us a time frame that you think you can have your recommendations all complete. Because I can tell you July, but you may think you want to go back and hear something else from another resource group and so forth. So we could say July, at our July task force meeting, that we want your recommendations by then, if you want to do that. 
Fernando, is that okay? Yes, ma'am. I, 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 I just uh, like working with the I would suggest what we're doing. Let, let, me, let me see if I can try to put uh, your work in context. We are, we are delivering a final report to the City Council no later than December, early December. Early December. Your last regularly scheduled meeting would be in November. Okay. Now, I think you want to allow probably two months for uh, public review and comment and discussion about the comments you received uh, and any modifications you may wish to make in response to those comments. I would suggest you get uh, your uh, draft recommendations out in the public by September, which is to say, uh, by August, consistent with what you've just heard from Rosa, by August, each committee should have some draft recommendations ready for discussion by this full task force, because ultimately, the recommendations won't be the recommendations of the committee, it'll be the recommendations of the full task force. And you're gonna need to allow plenty of time because uh, one committee may recommend actions A, B, and C, and you know full well the full task force may want to recommend D, E, and F. Uh, and so uh, I think it makes sense no later than the August meeting of this task force for each committee to come forward with its uh, draft recommendation. And if you, want to, if you have something by July that you want to share, bring that with you. Because probably December first is the city council meeting, and I don't know if they have another council meeting after then or not. December, so and yeah, we're aiming at the, yeah, we're at the council that, that's meeting. That's exactly what I said. What's the time on Tuesday, back? December fourth is the city council work session, work session where you would be presenting your report. The first Tuesday in December. So how do we? How are we going to send it back out to the community? Are we having more town halls or putting it on the web? And when will that take place? I think we'll probably want to discuss those questions among the co-chairs and then bring it back to the full task force. So we need to talk about that and then you need to be able to give you more information. Because we've got to get it back out and validate it. It hasn't been validated yet. Once, once you have specific recommendations, uh, if, by specific we mean you've costed it out, you determine who ought to deliver it, you determine how you're going to measure results, and then you get it out to the people who are going to be affected by it and let them respond to it. So if you're recommending something that's going to involve action by the school board, the school board needs to have a chance to respond. Is it doable? If it's going to require action by the Chambers of Commerce, if it's going to require action by faith-based organizations, whatever uh, the... Uh, Any nonprofit that's out there that... Whoever's going to be responsible for implementing uh, these recommendations is going to have, to have an opportunity to review it and say, yes, it is feasible. Yes, we can do it. Uh, otherwise, we're not going to have credibility. We need to vet these recommendations. And then, then it's got to be responsive. We need to be able to trace. We want, I think we want to trace these recommendations back to those findings. We made some findings about uh, a, a disparate uh, a treatment of, uh, of, of citizens, various disparities. How, how do these recommendations directly address those identified disparities? We had a form at the, uh, also do, yeah. that the committees uh, should be filling out so that we have some of that information together. Because I know we're, have, we, we're talking about this verbally, but are we getting those forms back from the committees? It, it's been inconsistent. Okay, I think we need to make sure that we move forward getting that, those forms completed from each of the committees so that when we have here, we have something to reference. Otherwise, we're saying that you're meeting twice a month and we're, we're not referencing any, any information that you all may be, uh, you know, receiving uh, and learning from you. Then we, as a, a full task force, don't have that information available to us. Rosa, we'll be glad to prepare an, an updated form that goes into greater detail about mm -hmm. our expectations so the committee will know exactly uh, what to submit. Good. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Uh, Katie, did you have anything well, else? We uh, postponed meeting until after this meeting because we needed exactly this information is what we were waiting for. So that when we do meet again, we've already started talking about recommendations, not in that detail, but we've all, ideas have been floated. We've discussed some of the staff, the feasibility. Um, so we've started that process, but this is what I was waiting for, was formatting and that kind of, and timelines and things like that. Uh, transportation. Anybody? Okay. 
to all right same boat okay. all right uh, our future our next meeting is going to be on June the 18th here and uh, again third Monday of July to November five o'clock here and then December 4th is our city council presentation co-chairs do you have any closing remarks <laughs> well, I want to thank you all for being here. I know it's uh, a week before a three-day weekend and it's hot outside, but we do have these individuals that came and were able to talk to us, and I think they're willing to work with us and work with HRC uh, to better their um, presentation or the assumptions that are out there in the community. We know that there is some things happening out there in the community. Um, some may be exaggerated, some may not, but we need to uh, find out exactly what is happening so that we can correct those measures and move forward. Uh, thank you all again for being here. We'll see you next time.